Good afternoon and welcome once again to Digital Look TV. Joining us today is Craig Erlam. He is market analyst at Alpari UK. Craig, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, unfortunately, it seems that we're living in interesting times. Uh, if it's okay with you, let's start with Japan. We had recently uh, the remarks from the governor of the Bank of Japan saying that he expects above trend growth. Some people believe it, some do not. However, there is a reasoning, a certain logic, which you were talking to me about before the interview. And in essence, it seems to me that QE in Japan will get pushed out from Q2 to Q3. Why? Well, I think that we've got to look at is the, the reason why people see we're going to see it. The, people, the reason people think we're going to see a second round of quantitative easing um, and the reason for that is the consumption tax. Now, that was raised from 5% to 8% on the 1st of April. Um, and so people were, taught, were thinking, well, we've either got to see um, uh, an increase in the asset in the, in the quantitative easing program um, uh, at the April meeting last week, or if they don't believe that, if they want to wait and see some data, which is, as it turns out to be, was the case, mm -hmm. then the only time you're going to see reliable data is f four or five months down the line because uh, there was so much uh, additional spending in Japan uh, with people preempting this uh, consumption tax hike that you've got to allow one, two, three months uh, following the in introduction of the rate of the. Uh, of the consumption tax hike uh, where people are going to be spending less because they've spent so much before and therefore you're going to have distorted figures so any you can't really read into the next couple of months data from the bank from from, from japan mm -hmm. and therefore if the bank if the bank of japan decided that they couldn't act now then realistically they've got to wait for four or five months down the line then they can average out the data and see what the real impact of that tax hike has been do you think the bank of japan is right in putting off and waiting putting off further qe and waiting for more data or Perhaps, yes, it won't have reliable data, but we all know what the end game is going to be. What's, where do you stand on that? Well, I guess based on what they were saying, they're saying that we don't know what the end of the game is going to be. They're saying that we, they still expect to hit that 2% inflation target mm -hmm. uh, on time. They, they're seeing improving growth in the country, and therefore they're seeing no reason to, uh, to doubt this. Mm -hmm. And if, if what they say is correct, then we can't just take the next two months of data and all of a sudden change, change, change their mind. They've mm -hmm. got to play this out and see what the real impact on the economy has been, and that's got to be um, four or five months away. I, th I, I personally think they should have preempted this because the last time that we saw a consum consumption tax hike mm -hmm. in Japan, uh, the country fell into recession, and I think that should have been uh, considered a lot more um, by the Bank of Japan, but they chose not to, which means they've left themselves really uh, having to wait for a, a few more months at least. Okay. Moving on to another geography, the United States. The last or the latest non-farm payrolls report. It came out more or less at 200,000, give or take. Initial reaction, it's quite a good report. You don't agree with that? No, because I think that was in line with market forecasts. I think the market forecasts were around just short 200,000. Mm. I think the figure was 193. So like you say, in line with expectations. Indeed. And ordinarily, that is a good enough figure when you're trying to, when you're talking about a recovery and you want to see good job creation, that mm -hmm. is a good figure. Mm -hmm. um, but then if we take a look at January to February reports, they were extremely poor. And mm. the, the reason given for the, these poor, this poor data mm -hmm. was the fact that there was unusually poor weather in the US, uh, which people accepted to an extent, especially in month mm -hmm. one and two, it was starting to wear off a little come uh, right. February and people were starting to really question uh, whether the data was whether distorted or whether uh, the economy uh, was just not recovering covering as well as they'd initially hoped. Mm -hmm. So what you'd hope to see is if the weather was truly distorting this data, yes. then some of that job creation should have really carried over into March and also into the next couple of months as well. So in reality, if we are seeing a good recovery in the US, what we needed to see was something closer to 250,000. Some people were even calling for 300,000 jobs to be added in the mm -hmm. US uh, in March okay. to really show that, that the, the poor data in those months has been offset by uh, stronger figures now. But instead, we just saw a standard good month. And for me, that's not good enough. All right. <clears throat> Let's link the two themes, Japan, United States. Japan does not, is not quite what it seems or what the Bank of Japan wants to, wants to portray. The U.S. perhaps not quite as strong as it seems as many are indicating that or that they thought it was. <clears throat> we see both of these trends reflected in volatility. You were telling me about how volatility has decreased considerably, for example, in the reaction to the latest jobs report. Mm -hmm. you, can you explain... Run our, read our viewers through some of these, some of the details. Uh, what might be, what are the factors leading to that reduced volatility? What exactly reflects volatility is something usually that really most, most of our viewers, I, I think, aren't able to follow as it's a very specialized characteristic of financial markets. 
Well, I think volatility in the markets overall hasn't decreased. I think we've seen plenty of volatility. For example, the, the pair we were discussing was dollar yen, and I think we've mm -hmm. seen plenty of volatility over the last few months in mm -hmm. the pair, which has been driven by things, uh, geopolitical events and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I think we've seen plenty of volatility in the, in the pair itself. But what I found interesting was around the non-farm payrolls release, as we were discussing, is the fact that uh, the trading range on a, on a day around mm -hmm. the, the non-farm payrolls mm -hmm. can tends to be much larger than any other day. We tend to see big swings uh, mm -hmm. in currencies. We tend to see the same in other, uh, in other assets as well, in equities mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and commodities and other, and other assets on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, but what we saw on this day was half an hour after the non-farm payrolls release, the trading range on that day was 40 pips, so 0.4 cents. And mm -hmm. uh, I'd say the average day is on the non-farm payrolls release day. There can be north of it tends to be north of 100 and can be almost 150 200 pips so to see such a small uh, amount of volatility around that release mm -hmm. well it says it says a couple of things to me it tells me that people don't truly understand how to understand the data because okay. we've got it, it doesn't swing in one way or another we haven't had a very good figure mm -hmm. we haven't had a very poor figure either mm -hmm. we've had something in the middle that says t says t tells people there's a recovery there and hmm. maybe we're on for 2.5 percent growth and if we can see two three more months of this then it suggests that it's gathering a little bit of momentum and we that we've got something to be optimistic mm. about mm -hmm. but it doesn't tell you that it's there yet and okay. that's what people want to see now especially after three three months of terrible data mm -hmm. really slightly hmm. improving over the months but still pretty poor data yes. uh, people needed something to re to build their optimism again that mm -hmm. we are seeing going to see this strong recovery in the US and everywhere you look now people are really doubting the US recovery and people don't really know what to take from this mm -hmm. uh, are, are we bearish are we bullish and i think this tr this reflected people's uncertainty on this subject okay do you think perhaps because of all this uncertainty people quite a few traders are a little bit to a certain degree sitting on their hands? I'd say it's possible, especially around the major economic events. So the people mm -hmm. who trade in these major economic events may be a little bit unsure and maybe even be a little bit deterred when they see that a non-farm payrolls figure have such a minor impact. But then you can look at other releases mm -hmm. and they've had much bigger impact. So people are maybe just being a bit more selective about what, especially mm -hmm. P traders that trade events have been a lot more selective about okay. what they potentially trade. So, for example, a few weeks back we had the uh, U.S. consumer sentiment figures. Now, this mm -hmm. is just a survey mm -hmm. uh, of consumer sentiment, so it's more forward-looking, I'd say, than non-farm payrolls. Right. And uh, we saw a, we saw a big uh, we saw a lot of positive, a very positive reaction to this mm -hmm. number because it significantly beat expectations. So maybe this just suggests that people are paying less attention to the the the, the more backward-looking data mm -hmm. and paying more attention to the surveys because this is going to give us more of an indication of what kind of summer it's going to be. In the summer is such an important <clears throat> time for okay. a country like the US. Never, nevertheless, those aren't the only possible sources of uncertainty, even though that is uncertainty is not the main factor. However, there are some wild cards out there, the Ukraine crisis, recent events in that country. How complicated do you see the situation becoming? I'd say it's got the potential to be extremely complicated because uh, we, we all saw what kind of an impact the, the, the situation in Crimea had mm -hmm. um, and what impact that had on the markets. We saw uh, real, big real big amounts of risk, risk aversion at times mm -hmm. and um, I think the dollar yen pair was really key to highlighting that by the fact that all, one minute it's looking very bullish, it looks like it's going to take off to the upside. The next thing you know there's there's, there's more unease mm -hmm. over this, over what's going on in Crimea. There was, um, all the, we, we all saw the stories, and all of a sudden people are favouring yeah. the, the, the risk, the safe haven mm -hmm. aspect of the yen, so we had big swings there. Um, so I think there's, you can see that based on what happened in Crimea, there's, there, there could be potential, uh, very, it could, it could mm -hmm. get messy further down the line. And now there's been reports that, um, that, that there's been an, a, a small minor uprising mm -hmm. in Donetsk, mm -hmm. and then which. Putin, Vladimir Putin at the time distanced himself from and said mm -hmm. he was leaving it to the Ukraine to deal with uh, with their Western allies, mm. um, which sounds good on the face of it until you hear other reports that uh, these guys had been paid by Russia um, to um, to create this uprising and cause mm. an uprising which would then potentially provide the opportunity for Russia to justify their moves. And once they start moving into somewhere like the Ukraine, then it gets a lot more complicated. And uh, I think that, that's, that's where the, the uncertainty mm -hmm. is created mm -hmm. because um, it's been such a long time since we've had this standoff between the West and Russia uh, and that's mm -hmm. where the uncertainty is created and the, 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 the old cliche the markets really hate uncertainty. Definitely. <clears throat> as far as uncertainty and for the trader in FX markets on a daily basis, dollar yen it's a, 
fairly widely traded cross. Mm -hmm. You were telling me, yes, indeed, volatility, but also choppiness related to haven flows. Mm -hmm. uh, you were telling me that it was a bit of a, traders were having a bit of a case of whiplash when trying to trade the dollar yen. Is this right? Yeah, well, like I was saying, um, the, the dollar yen for me in the long term is, a, is very bullish. Mm -hmm. um, when we're looking purely, well, just you, you, you just have to look <clears throat> at the stance of both central banks. Hmm. We've got the Federal Reserve, uh, they're tapering, so they're essentially becoming less stimulative. Mm -hmm. um, they were talking about interest rate hikes in the middle of last, next year. There was three more members at the last FOMC meeting that voted in favour, uh, that, well, that had their forecasts. Uh, said claimed that they were uh, going to sit that they expected one percent interest rates mm -hmm. by the end of 2015. Okay. On the other side of that, you've got the Bank of Japan, which could now uh, increase its quantitative easing program uh, in three, four, five months' time, when, whenever mm -hmm. uh, that may finally come. Um, mm -hmm. So they're, they're swinging in different ways. But what we're seeing is, I think people are expecting that next that, that next move from the Bank of Japan in the next couple of in the, either this month, maybe next month, or mm -hmm. the month before to preempt the negative impact from that consumption okay. uh, tax hike uh, and you, you saw this real bullish setup forming on the dollar yen where we'd had a big move higher we'd mm -hmm. had a 50 percent retracement very technically brilliant um, it was we'd seen an ascending triangle form which is a bullish setup mm -hmm. and it was all looking very bullish and it was just a case of waiting for that next breakout right um, but then this this whole thing kicked off in Crimea and mm -hmm. the dollar's a safe haven currency but even more so the yen's a safe haven currency so we went from having this nice bullish setup to a break below uh, to an instant rebound higher through this bullish setup and then we had more uh, risk aversion because of uh, the, the situation getting worse and then that broke back below and what it left us with what was a fantastic setup um, technical setup on the dollar yen pair and just left us with what you said it was that whiplash that we had and technically speaking now it just looks like a bit of a mess mm -hmm. um, and we may just now have to wait a few more months we, and it's not unusual in the dollar yen pair we've seen it plenty of times before where we see this uh, almost choppy sideways trading were playing out for a period we saw it in the lead up to the announcement of the first the quantitative easing program okay. and I think we may see it now for a few more months okay going on with the theme of Traders <clears throat> increasingly are focusing or placing particular emphasis on certain data releases. Just today we had inflation numbers coming out in France, in Greece, both undershot expectations. Markets took it negatively. It seems like markets, traders are very watching with keen interest everything happening in the Eurozone as far as inflation releases, that sort of thing. The ECB has not acted yet. What's going through Mario Draghi's well, that's the million dollar question. Mm -hmm. I think that's something we'd all like to know. Um, based on the previous press conferences, you can see that there's a, a real reluctance there to act. Um, not because they don't want to ease monetary policy, but because interest rates are at 0.25%. Mm -hmm. A 0.1%, 0.15% interest rate cut is going to have absolutely no impact. The last 25 basis point rate cut had no impact whatsoever, well pretty much no impact whatsoever, mm -hmm. which means they've got, the ECB are now going to be forced to move into uncharted territory, which they're clearly uncomfortable with, they're clearly reluctant to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why we've not seen any action from the ECB over the last few months. You've got to remember, inflation fell from 1.1% to 0.7% in a month. They immediately yes. cut interest rates. Since then, it rose to 0.9 and it's gradually moved down to 0.5% and yet they're not interested in cutting interest rates and that can only tell you that they're not they're not comfortable with the situation mm -hmm. and they're extremely reluctant to um, to stimulate the uh, to, to use any other form of monetary stimulus okay um, might a reduction in the deposit rate going into negative territory could that be sufficient it could be sufficient, but I guess the problem with that is it's, untried, it's not been tried and tested. Right. Um, other central banks have opted instead of quantitative easing. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone, everyone you seem to speak to in the markets now thinks the ECB need to, ta to attempt quantitative easing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it'd be favourable over uh, a negative deposit rates because we've not seen the impact of negative deposit rates <clears throat> from other central banks. We have seen what the impacts of quantitative easing has been and especially that first round of quantitative easing. Mm -hmm. That seems to have worked. Obviously, we've seen in the US that maybe the third round of quantitative easing had diminishing effects. But we've seen in the UK it's had a positive impact. With the US it had a positive impact. The, uh, Japan we've seen a positive impact. Indeed. So I think that's what we need to see from the ECB. And I guess the positive thing here is the fact that they, are, they do seem to be coming round to the idea. Um, even a few months ago people were of the impression that quantitative easing uh, was illegal. Mm. Um, uh, 
But now we've seen that they've been discussing it at the meetings and their most hawkish member, um, head of the Bundesbank, Jens Weidmann, has, has said that he's open to the idea of quantitative easing. So right. uh, that has to be a positive. But really, right now, until they actually act with uh, act on this, mm -hmm. people, people are going to be very... Uh, aren't going to be very happy with right. the situation. Well, illegal doesn't ne necessarily mean wrong. Absolutely not. I think it'd be the, the correct decision. I think it's only a matter of time. Of course, we've got to remember with the Eurozone, and this may be why they're putting it off, they're maybe doing a lot more homework, mm. is that um, quantitative easing in the UK is a lot simpler than with the Eurozone. In the mm -hmm. UK, you have, um, you have the US Treasury, uh, the, 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 the Treasury, uh, the, sorry, the gilts that the yes. government was buying. Mm -hmm. In the US, you've got the Treasury bonds, which the mm. Federal Reserve was buying. Right. What does the ECB buy? There's been talk of uh, buying countries' debt in the se secondary market, mm. uh, but which countries' debt will be eligible? Right. How much do they buy of each country's debt? How do they work out the weighting here? Is um, it really eligible? Well, it, it, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, I, think, I think they've got to think this through. They can't really exclude some countries mm. um, if they're going to do this correctly. What, do we really need to see lower German yields or... Should they be Probably. more open to buying things like Greek debt, especially now that it's had that uh, successful debt auction yes, today? Yes, I think yes, they've got mm -hmm. to be more open to buying all all debt if they're going to do this. Um, the other option that they've talked about is corporate debt, but I think that's potentially just as complicated. Okay. The euro dollar, where do you see it heading? I see it heading north in the very short term. It's okay. trading around 138.70 at the moment, mm -hmm. but this, when I say that, I mean up until the point that the ECB cuts in, uh, up until the ECB acts. ECB and at that squeals. point, uh, I think, yeah, I think then it's got, I, th I think there's only so much further, so much further it can go. We're already seeing the impact of this, more, this, this appreciating currency. Mm. They, I think this is having an impact on that, uh, the inflation figure as well. The stronger your currency, the more, uh, the more of a disinflationary impact it has um, on the, on, on, on Inflation, um, and I think I think we're approaching a massive level now. I think 140 is a massive psychological level uh, when you look when, when we're talking about from a trading perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think if we start to creep up on that level and we start to see the inflation figure continuing to fall, I don't think the ECB is going. I don't think the ECB is going to have any choice anyway. I mean, I think the ECB is going to have to do something. They're, right. they're just they're, they've got no alternative, and there's only so long you can put it off and blame it on falling energy prices and temporary mm -hmm. effects and say, but don't worry, because uh, our inflation expectations see inf returning to 2%. That's a very subjective view. That's nothing that the markets can really, um, can really question you on because it's mm -hmm. your own inflation expectations. Uh, but there's only so low that inflation can go. And if we continue to see the euro appreciating, then it's going to have further dis uh, disinflationary effects. And therefore, I think the ECB are going to be forced to act. So I think 140 is going to be pretty much the limit, give or take. And then I think once they finally act, I think they'll be a little bit cautious with it. But I think mm -hmm. we could be moving back towards 135 area. So then just like the ECB, what we have to do is watch, be patient, 140. That's the possible trigger for action. Yes. Yeah, I think so. I mean, obviously, that's just a, from a trading perspective, from a trader's mm -hmm. perspective, that's just a, a big technical level, a big psychological level. But I think once we're reaching these levels, then I think the the, the, the disinflationary impact is going to force the ECB into action. Fantastic. Craig Erlum, market analyst, a part of the UK. Thank you very much for your time. We do hope that you will join us again next week. Yes? Absolutely. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your time. And that's all for today from all of us here at Digital, Digital Look TV from London. Until next week.